winds of change are blowing through Raider Nation. And Silver and Black Today keeps you up to date with the latest news and views about your Las Vegas Raiders. Touchdown, Las Vegas! With insight, opinions, and interviews. We're on the cutting edge of what's happening now. Now, now, with the latest on your Raiders and the NFL. Your host, Scott Goldbranson and Mo Houghton. All right, I hope the start of your week is going well. Welcome back to Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast covering the Las Vegas I uh, Las Vegas. Las Vegas Raiders. Yes, let's get it out. It is early. We're recording early today. And I am Scott Cobranson, your host, joined by my partner, Mo Moten. He's a senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report and also Raiders columnist at sportsnot.com. You can also catch him on uh tn is it it's tnt right mo tnt true TV. true tv all over the place so yes he's he's bonafide now he's all over the place you can follow him on x.com if you'd like to interact been a little salty the past couple weekends because people don't read his tweets uh the they, they take it out of context mo moton m-o-e-m-o-d-o-n and i am at lv gully the show snb today do us a favor subscribe wherever you get your audio if you're watching us on youtube hit that subscription and the notifications bell we appreciate it very much mo how you doing man you uh we got we got this run up to the draft and of course then after the draft you have some mini camps and things like that which are kind of anticlimactic they you can't tell much about these rookies they just come in to get used to the facility know the people around know where their locker is that kind of jazz but these two weeks man we're we're pedal to the metal heading up to the draft coming up in detroit at the end of the month Got some good stuff coming up for the audience in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I've been doing this a while now, so I know usually two weeks away from the draft, things start to get really intense and people are just ready to see what actually happens instead of talking about what could happen. Yes. And it, that's what's funny to me, though, as well, is we get we get a lot of comments here at Silver and Black today, whether it's on the audio side or on the video side on YouTube. And people are like, oh, these mock drafts are dumb. Now, we haven't really done mock drafts. We we're covering the draft. I've done some, I did a mock draft on our show over on Sports Not, different NFL show. And um, the comments are always funny to me because people, there's people who don't like them. And I'm not a big mock draft guy either. Like, I, I, didn't, I don't find a lot of interest in it. I will, when I was back, when I was a fan, I would just read about my team and say, okay, who could they get here and what do they need? So I, that's what I did. And but the thing is, if 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 people didn't read them and people didn't like them, then media companies like the one you work for, the one I work for, wouldn't do them because people wouldn't have an interest, right? But people do. I think it fills the gap in between, really, the combine and the draft. People want to read something and they want to kind of guess where their team's going to go. Some people don't, but that's the beautiful thing about content these days is you can choose what you like and what you don't like, and and see what you want. And if you don't want it, then you don't. But today, we are not doing a mock draft. Today, we are going mm -hmm. to highlight, as we did last week, uh, we're going to highlight this, this show, the defensive line. Uh, the Raiders have needs on the defensive line. Some of you will say, wait a minute, they signed Christian Wilkins. They're good. No, you always need depth. You need some more help up front. Do they need help at edge? Uh, I don't think so. Could they draft an edge player? Maybe late in the draft, which is more of a project player. So we'll get into that, though. Uh, but we wanted to first talk about the interior of the defensive line because the interior of the defensive line, Mo, has been good, not great. Uh, we go back a couple years ago. It's improved from then. We saw the entire defense improve, obviously, last year towards the end of the year under Antonio Pierce. But uh, the needs on the inside, you can never have too many, just like on the offensive line, depth, rotation, especially with the way Patrick Graham's uh, scheme goes, the fact that they could get some more depth there. Some of these rookies, or excuse me, veterans coming back, you think about who they have today. Obviously, they signed Christian Wilkins. They have Byron Young. Nesta Jade Silvera signed a, a contract. He was in the doghouse last year. Maybe he gets out this year. John Jenkins, Adam Butler, Matthew Butler, right? So those are your inside guys. Not bad, but also not amazing, and, and you certainly could use some depth. When you look at the interior of that defensive line, Mo, what is it that you're looking for perhaps in this draft for the Raiders to do? We'll get into the players in a minute, but but what what do they really need when it, when you look at the inter, inside of that defensive line? I think they really need a, a young run stuffer, 
Now, mm. I want to start off by saying Byron Young, I don't know where he is with this regime. Are they going to give him more playing time this upcoming season? Because he didn't really touch the field last year. He's a third round pick. This wasn't like a, a sixth or seventh round pick. It's a third round pick. Usually third round picks, you want to at least get them on the field for a significant <laughs> amount of time to see what they got because they those could be rotational players or starters. So I think the key to this is what do they see in Byron Young? If they draft the offensive tackle relatively early before the fourth round, it doesn't bode well for him. If they wait until day three, a fifth, sixth round, seventh round pick, then maybe they give him a shot. But I will still say, despite signing Christian Wilkins and re-signing Adam Butler and re-signing John Jenkins, you want a young, I think, a young mm -hmm. stuff for a long-term guy because those guys are on short-term contracts, the veterans. So I'm looking at maybe the Raiders in the third to fifth round getting a player at the position. Yeah, no, and, and that's good that you said that because that, that segues perfectly into how I want to set up the discussion here and, and let the listeners know, if you look at the Raiders, and, and as we stand today, you know, things can change. There could be trade-ups, trade-downs. You know how it goes on draft day. But right now, Raiders, first round, second round, 13-44 is a picks, number pick. You get to the third and fourth round, they have picks 77-112 in the fifth, and then so on. We have sixth from Kansas City, excuse me, and then two sevens from New England and Minnesota. So you look at the situation, the assumptions I made, Mo, when I was – uh, preparing for this and, and, and preparing my show notes for this is that um, uh, they, assuming that from a defensive standpoint, yes, we know they need cornerbacks, right? So that could be an issue. They could go cornerback in the third round. They could go cornerback in the fourth round. It, it, who knows? But the assumption that I made was that they're going offensive line quarterback or offensive line cornerback, depending what happens with the first and second round picks, right? So the earliest they're going to get to a defensive lineman to me is going to be that third round. So I took out the guys. Now, defensive tackle class, much better than the defensive end class, which we'll talk about later. But I that's where I went. I went and said, okay, they're going to pick this person in the third round is the assumption. Because guys like Tavondre Sweat, who, of course, was arrested over the weekend. So who knows? His, his draft stock may fall now. I doubt it, but it could out of Texas. He's going to be at the top of the draft first round. You have a Michael Hall Jr. out of Ohio State. He's probably going to go in the second round. So I, I think he's going to be out of range for the Raiders. So we go for the third round here is where we're starting. I just want to set the expectation there when people talk about that because, well, why that guy's better? This guy's better. Well, yeah, he is, but he'll be gone because I don't think the Raiders go defensive line until the earliest in the third round. So, Mo, when we do that and we put that filter on it and we say okay they get to the third round and now they're looking for some defensive line help knowing that they need a run stopper but somebody who can also still cause enough disruption up front to help the guys on the end Tyree Wilson Max Crosby who first if you're going to select a guy and you're the Raiders GM you're Tom Telesco let's get into this if you're sticking at number 77 who's your pick there on the interior of the defensive line I probably start looking at Chris Jenkins out of Michigan. Now, Chris Jenkins doesn't have big sack numbers, but as I said, I think the what the Raiders should be looking for is a run stopper, and that's part, that's his strong suit. Uh, Chris Jenkins, obviously, his dad played in the NFL, most notably had um, with the Panthers, was a multi-time Pro Bowler. Mm -hmm. Again, he's not the guy that's gonna probably be on the field all three downs, especially with your pass rush. But you also got to understand you're probably the Raiders are probably gonna have Tyree Wilson still play on the inside. And sub packages. So now you got Christian Wilkins rushing the pass. You got Adam Butler. You got you got John Jenkins. You got Tyree Wilson possibly moving inside in sub packages. I uh, talked about Byron Young. I think Chris Jenkins fits in where you can say, okay, we're not expecting him to rush the passer and get a handful of sacks. We need him to help our run defense because two things, right? The last year the Raiders struggled with their run defensive stretches. Mm -hmm. Those Charger teams that Tom Telesco built. What did that defense struggle with for, for years? The Chargers have struggled <laughs> to stop the run. Yes. That's been their biggest problem, and those are Tom Telesco-built teams. So I think maybe he corrects that wrong with the Raiders, and he focuses on uh, run stoppers when he picks defensive line. Yeah, I mean, that that is true. And I think I think that you start to look in this range, and 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 I, I, I like him. I think he is a good player, Jenkins. Um, I can, I'm concerned. It depends. He could go in the second. 
right? So now, but the, the Raiders could be trading into the second. Again, here's where I'm thinking if the Raiders really like a guy like Chris Jenkins, they might have to get into the bottom of that second round, um, depending where he goes. I mean, again, the, the, it's all a guess on the rankings based on their combine. Obviously, Chris Jenkins is a guy that's been uh, under on a on a stage with with Michigan. He know people know who he is, obviously, because they had such a great year, won a national championship, all that stuff. So, yeah, I, I think so. I think he's a he's a good selection. I went a little more my top guy. I think it'll be a little bit, bit controversial here because I went with a guy that's got some issues that will remind people of Tyree Wilson, even though he's on the inside. And that's Mason Smith from LSU. So Mason Smith from LSU is a guy that I think will be there in the third round. Um, had a good year. Uh, again, not a big sack guy either, but he's incredibly gifted as an athlete. He had a he had an injury, a knee injury in 2022, which slowed him down. But last year, 12 games, 28 tackles, four and a half for a loss. Uh, he was suspended one game before NCAA because he did an autograph session. Mike. Yeah. Wasn't like some salacious BS. It just is what it is. <laughs> um, but I mean, you, the combine 19 and a half miles per hour GPS. He's got a, a 11, uh, he's could touch 11 feet in his vertical jump, right? He's got that lateral agility that I think in the NFL re relates well to, to your point about the run blocking. Um, and he can do a little bit of pass. I mean, he can, he, if he needs to, but he's good against the run. He also has a really high motor. I, I think from a personality standpoint, um, he's a guy who could really fit in well with a defensive unit and the personalities they have over there. I know, I know a lot of people will look at this and say, well, he's not very good, but he kind of reminds me of Javon Kinlaw a little bit size wise. I mean, he's, uh, he's six, five, three Oh six big dude. Right. And so he's going to be there and he's got a nice bull rush to him too. So I think he's one of those guys that, that yes, injury issue issue there uh but so far in all his workouts before this draft he has shown no ill effects of the knee injury and is a guy that i think might be a, a good selection for the raiders and probably will be there if they were to be sitting at 77 uh and he was the best guy available now maybe he's not or again it goes back to who they like mo but these are the kind of guys i think that are are are, are realistic and we got a couple more we're going to get into as well i'm sure you do as well but but these are the kind of guys I think you're right. He he can help with that run stop, especially to to help out that defense and allow those ends to free up and actually do what they do, which is go after the quarterback. Right, and you're you're the guy that you brought up. I mean, Smith's probably going to be available in the third round. Yeah. The reason I think Chris Jenkins, I know he's in some mock drafts, he may be pegged as a as a second round pick. The reason I think Chris Jenkins will be there in the third round is because, as I said. Not much pass rush production, and usually yeah. defensive tackles yeah. who don't have much pass rush production fall a little bit in the draft because one is not a premium position unless you are a pass rusher. Unless you're Ed Oliver, Quinn and Williams, defensive tackles usually don't go early unless they have some type of pass rushing potential. Correct. And like, and as I said, with the Raiders, I, I don't feel like pass rush potential is something they absolutely needed the defensive tackle position. Again, you paid a lot of money to Chris, Tr Christian Wilkins. You brought Adam Butler back. Ty Wilson should be, again, still kicking inside. We don't know what Byron Young's role is going to be, mm -hmm. if he is going to see the field. But I, I think the one thing the Raiders sh should absolutely focus on is, is being able to stop the run. Because like I said, that for a stretch, that was one of their weaknesses last season. And that, that's something they have to shore up. Yeah, I know they brought back guys. They brought guys back and paid a lot of money to, to one of the top free agents. <laughs> but you want you want a you want a, a young rotation because your defensive linemen, yeah, most of those guys are playing what 30 to 60 snaps, 30 for the low side. 60 from the high side if you're on the field for two thirds of the snap. So you need a rotation of what five, six guys who are going to be on the field and contributing in different roles. Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree hundred percent. And you're right. I mean, again, though, but if you, if the Raiders, depending what happens with their first and second round picks and how they, if they move up, we're going on the assumption they stay pat, right? We're not, we're not do factoring in trades because we don't know. So I think based on that, yeah, if you get a second second round pick, for example, because you've moved around, he's a guy I would grab in a second, Jenkins, no question about it. One guy too, and I want to get your reaction to this, because here's a guy I think 
will be available third, um, maybe late third, even fourth, although I doubt it because I think there's some really good buzz about him. That you talk about a run stopper, this guy is the guy. Dwayne Carter out of Duke, 6'3", 309. This guy, this guy is a run stopper, Mo. I mean, you, the, the biggest criticism against him is he's not a big pass rusher. Well, <laughs> like you just said, if you, you don't need that. You, but you, if you got a guy who's specifically built – to stop the run, his lateral agility, like I'm watching video of him yesterday and I'm watching him against the run and he's just, he, it, you know, here we just had this eclipse in the United States this week. He like blocks out the sun when it comes to the running <laughs> game. I like Dwayne Carter and and I think it's 6'3", 309 and his low center of gravity, what he's able to do, his hands, if you watch his hands in the rush, um, and that bull rush I talked about before with, with Mason, he's the same. He can, he, that bull rush that he does disrupts the offense and the play, especially on a running play where it's a little more slow developing. Uh, and so I think he's a guy to watch for too. See, I, I said it's a decent pick uh, when I'm looking at defensive tackles and I see, and I know we're going to talk about edge here in a minute, but yeah. there are a lot of, there are a lot of, tw I would say tweener guys where, yeah. They're about 6'3, 6'4, 280, 290. And you're and you're wondering, okay, depending on where they where they go, are they going to be odd man front defensive ends? You know, where they're expected to stop the run more? Are they going to be even front defensive tackles? I think it's going to be up to these teams to decide where they fit. As far as Patrick Graham is concerned, I think, and this is why I said that the Rays are going to focus on a, a run stopper with maybe some pass rush ability, but not specifically that's may not be that person's or player's strong suit mm -hmm. is because if you look at Patrick Graham when he's with the Giants, right, he had Dexter Lawrence. <laughs> and we talked about Tavondre Sweat earlier, you know, got in trouble with, with DWI, I believe. He would, to me, he would have been the perfect pick. I'm not saying he would have been, you know, Dexter Lawrence, but um, when you look at a player who's massive in size, over mm -hmm. 360, now, there was a report that came out, I believe it was Dane Bruglier of The Athletic, said that during interviews, Tavondre Sweat had to talk about how the party life was behind him. And now this coming up, it could it could hurt his draft stock. And I know a lot of Raider fans have had him in their, in their mock drafts in the second round, so maybe in the first round. When I was talking about Byron Murphy the second, a lot of people prefer Tavondre Sweat for that reason, because he's more of, I guess, a run stopper, and that's what the Raiders needed. Yeah. Now, with this arrest happening, I'm not saying the Reds will take a chance on him, but if he's available in the third round, Oof. do you you know do you consider it yeah. even with the recent arrest over the past weekend? And I think it's actually something to think about. I know in past regimes have hammered character, 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 and things have happened even with those character players, you know, that you can't predict. So I'm wondering is is he worth the risk if Tavondre Sweat mm. is there in the third round? Is he worth the risk because I think he fits what what um what Patrick Graham wants to do with his team? It's a great point, and and that's where I talk about too. If he falls, I mean, he's it reminds me a little bit, although obviously not because because he 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 was much more um, highly rated player. But Jalen Carter last year, remember Jalen Carter? Raider fans yeah. wanted him, and of course he goes to the Eagles, has a nice season there but even though the Eagles fell apart. So you see that, and so does he go out of the first round? It, it depends. If he falls into the second round, if he falls into the mid-second round, the Raiders are at 44. I don't think they take it at 44, like you said. But if he falls below that, I'm, I would try to trade up if, 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 and get him if you can. If it's going to go late second round, like you say, Mo, let's say he fell that far, then then dang i try to move up i try to move up in the second round if i've addressed all my other needs if i've addressed my offensive line my quarterback or whatever cornerback whatever they decide to do then jump up there so so yeah i think that it's it's an interesting thing to watch you know it wasn't it was a dwi it's a class d b misdemeanor in texas but it to your point the interviews at the combine a lot of it was about him saying i'm not going to party anymore i'm not going to party anymore we don't know the full story yet on the DWI, what happened, right? So we'll see. The Raiders have to make that judgment. And you're right. Is Tom Telesco, unless Mark Davis is a guy saying, listen, if you got somebody who got arrested, you're not drafting him, then we don't know what Tom Telesco's record is. I don't recall anybody in the Chargers when he was there having issues like that. I'm sure there were. I just don't remember. So 
we'll have to check into that. I do want to say this, Mo. There, I do have I have a a, a, a late a, a late round dark horse at defensive tackle that I really like, and he did go nuts at the combine, and that's not not only why I like him. Uh, but, but, and that's, that's Braden Fisk from Florida state, six, four, two ninety five. I mean, the speed, he had a four, seven, eight, 40 at 292 pounds at the, at the combine. Okay. Vertical, all the show, all those things. He was like a freak of nature from a physical standpoint at the combine. He's a guy too, who does show some pass rush ability. Uh, but I will tell you that because he's able to move so quickly, um, he really is another guy that shows with his upper body strength and the physicality that he has. I think he would be a good run stopper. I'm, this is a guy I think you can get, even with the, the great PR he's gotten from the combine, you could probably get him in the fourth, maybe even fifth round, depending what, how much the buzz holds over into the draft. But he's a guy I like as well. See, I think Brady and Fisk is going to go on day two. You think so? I, I, I do because... Now, I know he transferred. He was at Western Michigan for yep. three years and then transferred over and had a breakout at, at Florida State. And he has the pass rushing numbers. If you look at, you know, it's not always about sacks, but pressures too. He has mm -hmm. that. And, and I think with the combine that he had, Daniel Jeremiah couldn't stop talking about him during that <laughs> broadcast. And I'm not saying that alone is going to boost his stock, but the pass rush production at a big at you know at a big time school Florida State yeah. then showing out at the combine I think it's going to help him and I think he's he'll probably I think he'll go mid late day 2 for a team that's looking for a penetrating defensive lineman because he fits that three technique three tech, uh, yeah. role that you that you need in even man front so I think he's going to go a little earlier if he's available for some reason cuz he's not he's not the greatest run stopper he's the, I wouldn't right. say he's the complete defensive tackle and that may knock him down you know, a round or two, depending on what a team's needs needs are. Mm -hmm. But if a team needs, uh, you know, a, a guy's going to come in right away and be able to penetrate and get into the backfield, Fisk could be that guy. Yeah, I just, I see him in my mind, because he is a beast. I see him in my mind with Crosby on the end there, and just <laughs> the possibilities are crazy. He's got, he does have great pass rush moves, but even if he doesn't, to your point, even if he doesn't get the sacks, the the fact that he can make the penetration frees up Max Crosby or Tyrell, whoever, which side he's on. And man, I can just see that. But, but, but yeah, I think, I think you're right. It just depends how things you get to draft day. Even if somebody's had a great combine, you're right. Depending on what teams and I think how things fall and players where they go, it can change the outcome there. So really interesting stuff. Anybody else, Mo, that you want to talk about? Uh, you have a dark horse or anybody maybe later round that's worth a flyer on that might be the next Max Crosby, but on the inside, somebody you get fourth, fifth, sixth round that comes around? Uh, Jaden Crumity out of uh, Mississippi State. I think oh, he yeah. could be a guy that – go. I think he probably goes stay free. Yeah. Four-year starter, um, so he has experience. So if you want a guy who could possibly come in and play right away as a late-round pick, I think he can probably do that if, if he has if you carve out a role for him. Uh, can handle double teams. That's something that a lot of uh, run stoppers need to do because if they're, if you're, you know, if you're one tech on the inside, you're going to be dealing with uh, guards and sensors. What I will say is that his frame is kind of uh, lean. Poor I mean, yeah. <laughs> guy. He's about 6'4", 6'5", 301. So they may put a little, you know, weight on him before he takes the field. But I think he's a guy with his starting experience and his run stopping ability could be a factor on a rotational defensive line for the Raiders, you know, again, not playing 50, 60 percent of the snaps, but maybe 30 to 40 percent of the snaps and playing on early downs to stop the run. I think he's a good fit. Yeah. And, and it's funny. You see, guys, and this is where I think the, the biggest disconnect between fans and even even us in the media sometimes is you look at a guy and you say, well, yeah, like you're saying, you're talking about him being thin. Yeah, maybe add some weight. Listen, I said the same thing. I didn't like the Max Crosby pick. I always owned that because I was completely wrong. On draft night, we were doing a live show in Las Vegas uh, on the radio, and I said, man, yeah, I can see the motor and all that, but, man, his legs are so skinny. I mean, what? And then, but see, what happens is you get in the NFL. Now, now Max Crosby's a freak because he works his ass off, so he does it himself. But also the NFL scouts, the guys who actually know football better than any of us combined – they see that potential. And that's the thing with the draft, you see, especially in those rounds you start talking about, Mo, when you get to 
third, fourth, fifth round, especially, there's guys that you see in them something that you say, hey, we get them into our program and and the 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 raw skill and abilities there that you can't teach. What you can teach is technique. You can get them with a NFL strength and conditioning coach, and guess what? You can see it turn around. So good, good selection there. I like that one. All right. Good deal. The one thing I'll say about I don't worry about weight unless a player is just totally like you know com completely undersized. Like you get right. those two hundred and thirty five pound edge rushers in an <laughs> even man front. That's that's not very good because <laughs> if you're on the end. Maybe if you're on an odd man front, you know, fine. But usually you get to the NFL, you know, you're going to have a personal chef. You know, <laughs> they're going to give you, you know, weight training program. Guys can put on 15 pounds very quickly. So I usually don't oh, yeah. worry too much about weight. But I, I do point it out that he's, you know, if a player is a little on the slim side, or the lean side, look, they're probably going to have to put on some pounds before they get into the, you know, get onto the field, do some strength training, and they'll be fine. Yes, Absolutely. It'd be interesting to see what Tom Telesco and Antonio Pierce, who they like, who's on their board. We are just a few weeks from finding out if they go defensive tackle. All right. We're going to take our break. When we come back for our final segment on this edition of Silver and Black today, we're going to talk about defensive ends. I know you're saying, well, we don't really need edged players. Well, you always look and you never know who's out there. And we'll get back and we're going to talk a little bit about the edge and the Raiders defense as it is our focus on this Tuesday edition of Silver and Black Today. You're with Mo and Scott. We're coming back right after these words. Welcome back, Silver and Black Today, the Tuesday edition. You're with Scott and Mo. We're glad you're here. We appreciate it. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio. If you're watching us on YouTube, subscribe and hit that notifications bell. We appreciate that very much. We are talking all defensive line today. Yes, where you win in the trenches. We talk, we'll mm -hmm. talk about offensive line. We talk about quarterback. We'll get into the defensive backs on Thursday, right? No, that's what we're doing. We talk about cornerbacks Safety and safeties. And, cornerbacks. Mm -hmm. and then people are out there, what about linebackers? Oh, the Raiders have linebackers? Yes, they do. <laughs> we'll get into that. Spillane had a great Linebackers year. exist? Yes, they do. It's a different world that we live in now, Mo, with the linebackers <laughs> and the days of the Lawrence Taylors and all that are gone, but they're still there. They're still important, and we'll talk about them too. But we are on the defensive line. We talked about tackles in the first segment. This segment... We're going to talk about edge players. Not a huge need for the Raiders, unless you are one of those people in the Tyree Wilson is a bust uh, camp, then perhaps you think they need an edge player. Which you, which you shouldn't be yet. You should not it's be. Too, it's just way too early to call. Yes. A bust. And I will say under, we'll just start there, under um, Antonio Pierce, I thought Tyree Wilson came along nicely at the end of the season. Remember, at the beginning of the season, Mo, you made the point last year of saying, hey, if we get to the middle of the season, that's when you would expect him to start showing something. Now, it took a right. little bit longer, but he was coming off the injury. And I thought he did, especially the last three or four games. Uh, Tyree Wilson was, you heard his name called. It was like, wow, okay, good. So we're starting to see it. He did move inside, outside. When you talk about that, Mo, explain to folks, Tyree Wilson drafted as an edge player, but we saw them move him inside, outside. He had that kind of diff that that hybrid role. Talk about why perhaps the Raiders did that. Why Patrick Ram maybe to get him going and to start seeing what he does well and the scheme. Why Tyree Wilson was moving inside and outside? Well, you saw it first in the Dolphins game. I think that's where you saw it first, and you saw it more against the Minnesota Vikings. And what you're trying to utilize is Tyree Wilson's quickness over guards you know interior offensive linemen so he's going to be a lot faster you know you know off the ball than most interior offensive linemen because remember at the beginning of the season his the knock against it was he's not getting off the line of scrimmage very quickly and then over time that improved i remember i'll never forget baldy from the nfl network was going off on him for being so slow off the line of scrimmage <laughs> and that improved over time and again when you're faster than interior offensive linemen and you have tyre wilson's strength at his size, 6'6", six, six, like in the 270s, 280, then you can be able to beat guards, you know, in the backfield against the run and be able to get to the quarterback. So you're trying to utilize his physical traits versus him outside against more athletic offensive tackles. And he, you know, they could probably body him off the line of scrimmage mm -hmm. and he's going to have issues getting to the quarterback. But against slower or slow-footed guards, he can have an advantage, and that's where you're trying to unlock his pass rushing potential. You saw a little bit of that, as you said, at the end of the season. 
Yeah, and I think a really smart move by Patrick Graham and Antonio Pierce because when you have a player like that, you have two. You, normally, you have a rookie, right? Rookies got to come in and find their way in the NFL. Some do it really fast. Some it takes a little bit of time. You gotta, you gotta build confidence. They, I, I think they saw that too. To your point, Mo, about beating the slower guard versus having to take on a tackle, and there's, and they, they faced some really good ones this past season. So to me, getting him that confidence, does that mean he'll remain inside outside? I think that's a little bit too of what Patrick Graham has dreamed up and said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to give you different looks so you don't know what's coming. So you might see Tyree Wilson out there on the end, and then suddenly you're seeing him on the inside in the NFL. Now they have tape from last year, obviously, but it just gives the quarterback a difference. Like, wait, this guy's lining up inside now. I have to worry about him coming up the middle versus or hit, hit the other gap. So, so to me, really smart. Does that mean he won't play end? No, I think you move him in and out, depending on what personnel is. To your point, a John Jenkins versus a Tyree Wilson on the inside, very different, different type of players and different types of speed. So really interesting stuff. And I think that you start to look at, you know, could the Raiders be in the market in the draft, especially because they're not going to go out and sign a big free agent edge player. They're not going to do that. But do they go get somebody in the draft, a, a developmental project? Because I'm thinking this is, this is at the highest I can imagine them taking an edge player in this draft, depending on what happens, is is really, like you said, day three. Uh, you know, fourth round, no, I don't see it. Maybe fourth round, depending on where they end up. But I'm thinking more five, six, and seven. And so you start to look at that and frame it from that perspective, Mo. Who catches your eye? These are all going to be players that have to develop. These are not players that they're going to have come in and start or get a significant amount of snaps, unless they go crazy in camp, that could happen. But but overall, these are players that they're looking at and saying, hey, they're a good talent at that, at that level, at that round, great value with a lot of upside on the athletic piece of it. Uh, who, who, who kind of uh, jumps out at you when we use that as our framing? I'm gonna sound like a Washington homer here because I talk about Michael Penix, I talk about Troy Fatanu. I'm going on the defense side of the ball and I'm gonna talk about Braylon Trice out of oh, Washington. Trice. I yep. think I yep. think he could be an option on day three, about 6'3", 245. Uh, I believe he was a team captain, so there are some leadership mm -hmm. qualities there. Of course, you're not asking to be a leader because you got Max Crosby in that position group, but it's good to have, a, you know, add players with leadership qualities. He has the sack production. I think he has the frame to play right away. He's, he's not a, a skinny frame kid coming in. I don't like to use the word kid, but he's not a skinny frame player coming into the NFL. I think he can immediately, if you if you want an edge rusher who has some upside and you're worried about maybe signing Ma Malcolm Koontz because you may lose him, mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, Braylon tries to be the guy to step up and, and fill a rotational role. Yeah, and I think that, that he he is he's a player though. I think I think with his raw ability with NFL coaching, um, that that he can he would actually see a significant amount of time because he's a player that you could probably get um Unless something goes nuts, you could probably get there, and he can come in and have an impact right away. I think, even though I'm, I kind of couch this as guys who are projects, excuse me, the projects or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, this is a guy that I think could come in. I, I really like him too. And and no, you're not a Washington homer, but they got good players. <laughs> I kept, you know what I kept doing? I just kept looking through defensive and offensive line, Mo, and I saw all these guys from UConn. I'm like, why is UConn not better in football? They have all these guys. <laughs> it's crazy. How many guys UConn has? And I'm going to get to one of those in a second. My guy in this range um, is another uh, another former, now I guess you say, former Pac-12, and that's Jonah Ellis out of Utah. 6'2", 248. Man, let me tell you something. You talk about a quick first step. Baldy, you love this guy. By the way, Baldy's going to be on the show next week, just as a tip. Um, so you guys, we're going to have Brian Baldinger back next week to, to go through the draft and specifically the Raiders and some of the players he likes there. But I like I like Ellis because not only does he get there from a pass rush perspective, but he's actually tough on the run too. He's so quick and lateral that he can do that, and he sheds. I mean, dude, he's shedding these blockers. I'm watching the, the tape. Uh, he's shedding these blockers like they're not even there. I mean, much bigger guys than him, and he's able to get around them. Sometimes go inside. He's got a, a lot of great moves. So here's a guy to me that he's got creativity on his side to get to the quarterback. And he did. He got to the quarterback a lot. That Utah defense, I don't know if people on the East Coast watched it very much. I know people on the West Coast did. Uh, and and that that defense was tough at times. And I think that he was a a, a reason for that. And, and I really like Ellis. I think he's a good guy. I said 6'2", 
248, and there's some music playing. I don't know. Is that you or is that me? I can't tell. Um, but anyway, it was me. Yeah, it's weird. I'm not a piano player, so. I don't know what the heck that was. Oh, well, but there you go. A little musical interlude. Is Jonah Ellis hacking our, our show? But anyway, Jonah Ellis, Mo, what do you think? Uh, I think that's a good pick as well. Like I said, we're we're not going to talk about because a lot of people are like, what about Latu out of UCLA? <laughs> what about, yeah. you know, Janarius Robinson? Those guys are going to go early. Latu's the first rounder, and yeah. I think Janarius Robinson had a strong enough uh, draft process where he's up to stock. He's one of those 20 guys I talked about early in the segment where he's about 285, 290, and you got to decide – you know, is, is he going to play and in an odd man front or is he mm -hmm. going to be a defensive tackle and an even man front? So as you said it, and I agree with you on this one, I don't think the Raiders are touching any defensive linemen at all, any position in, at earliest until the third round, because they have these glaring needs at cornerback across the offensive line. They think they need multiple players there. They may draft a quarterback. So that pushes everything else down, you know, into the you know fourth, fifth, sixth rounds. And yeah. you're going to have to look at these late round gems and see who can fit in your rotation. So we're mostly going to be talking about when you talk about defensive linemen, rotational guys. Yeah. And, and to me, the, the issue here as well is it's you go by, like you talk about different classes, like the quarterback class, obviously huge this year, right? No matter who you like, it's just, it's known as a great quarterback class. It's known as a great offensive line class, especially when you look at the tackles, there's even great guards and centers. It's a, actually a great center class. So you look at that this year on the edge, not a great class, uh, not terrible, but not great. So even if you were the Raiders and you needed edge and you're at 13, you wouldn't get maybe one of those guys. You get a good player, but I, I look at those guys. You mentioned that. I mean, you also look at Jared Verse out of Florida State and Dallas Turner out of Dallas Alabama. Turner. Those guys are at the top. But like you said, we were going on the assumption the Raiders aren't going to touch this till at the earliest third round, probably later than that. And when you say, well, yo, Max Crosby was a fourth rounder. So you just never know. And and I have one dark horse and I, I tipped it off, Mo, because you had your Washington. I got my UConn thing when it comes to, to linemen. <laughs> Jalex Hunt at UConn is a guy I like too. Eight sacks this year, five quarterback hits, 19 hurries, 32 pressures, very strong lower body. He's a guy that I think you're going to get way low sixth seventh round like your last pick in the draft right and he's a guy that would be a complete project but he's got the ability he's got the ability to i think not only rush the passer but he's got a really strong lower body his hand is technique and stuff like that not the best but when you start getting to the fifth sixth and seventh round you're not going to get a player that's ready to go you're going to get a player like Jal uh, uh jalex hunt who is a project but has all the raw talent you need to be successful in the nfl it's interesting because you, you talk about UConn players. So I would be fine if the Raiders went went with him and then had Christian Haynes in the second round, the guard out of, out of UConn. Yeah. And you you can you can kind of fortify the trenches with some UConn prospects, which would be interesting because, as I said last week, UConn is not known as a powerhouse because I know I brought up Haynes last week. But as you said, they have these players. But you, you know Scott comes down to the quarterback position. We're not hearing about <laughs> any UConn quarterbacks in the first round. So I, no. I guess that's where – that's where the problem comes with the program, but they have some prospects coming out that that could be, uh, you know, used in the trenches. And I believe a few years back, I believe the Ravens drafted and they had a UConn player as a defensive tackle that came out. I was a big fan of, and I think his name is escaping me right now. But yeah, you know, just because a player plays at a at a program that's not known at for churning out NFL talent doesn't mean you can't find gems at those programs. And I always say this every year, and I feel like I have to repeat it, is don't scout the helmet, scout the player. You know, you have to sometimes dig deep and find some of these players. Even if you have to look at a D3 program, you may find oh, players yeah. that, you know, translate well. You know, UConn, like I said, no more for its basketball, <laughs> women's and men's college basketball. But – you know, they have some football talent, too. If you look hard enough, you can find some gems there as well. Yes, and you're talking about Travis Jones. Yes, tackle. Travis Jones was drafted by the Ravens, I believe, in the third round. And I was third a round. big Travis Jones guy Yeah, come, when he came out of UConn. I felt like he could be a game changer. Now, hasn't gotten on the field as much as I thought he would, mm -hmm. but I think he could still be a, a pretty decent player. Yes, absolutely. And you go back, Byron Jones from the Cowboys was a UConn guy. And, of course, the Raiders drafted a UConn yes. player in the second yes. round in 2017. Obi Mellon Fonwu. 
didn't, didn't work, work out. out, but he was but an athletic point, machine. <laughs> he was a defensive back, though. We're talking about linemen. Yeah. And it's yeah. really interesting because I think you have a lot of schools like that. Now, Duke had a quarterback. Now he obviously transferred to Notre Dame. But Duke is the same way. Like, you will see linemen come out of those good schools, and they, they happen to be – uh, academic schools like Duke, UConn, I don't know if it's that academic, but they're great in basketball, obviously. Uh, but you look at, at, at those positions and you're right. You look at great Raiders of the past. Where did Howie Long go to school? Right? Villanova. Mm-hmm. Villanova football? No way. Forget about it, right? Big East. Exactly. So, so it's, it's your point. Don't scout the helmet. You scout the player. And so, so that that's that's why I'm I'm looking. I mean, it surprised me too because I really didn't. I'm going to start paying more attention to UConn this college football season just to watch their linemen because they got some kind of factory going there. So what's the lesson we learned today? If you need some guys in the trenches, you need a pass rush. Look to the look to the Northeast. I know we're known for our basketball up here in the Northeast corridor, <laughs> but we ha- we have some guys who can bang in the trenches too. Yeah, and the Big Ten. I mean, as you mentioned, yeah, Chris Jenkins at the top of the show, yeah. a tackle. You know, but remember, see, you might no, you're probably just old enough, Mo, that you remember the days when Nebraska was where like Nebraska would just pump yeah. out offensive and defensive linemen constantly. It was just like one year after that. Now that's not happened in quite a while. Dominican Sue. Yes, and Dominican Sue, exactly. So so those guys, but to me, that's where, you know, if the Raiders are interested in a guy, and they may do that late in the in the draft, but yes, they need cornerbacks. Safety, not a great class again, but we're going to get into that next episode when we talk through that. But I think that there's no question that the Raiders, again, you start to look at the defense. The defense is further along than the offense at this point. And they showed that at the end of last season. So what do you do now? You say, okay, we got a really good core. We got some glaring holes. Obviously, you need another outside cornerback. And to me, you need that inside defensive tackle. You do that along with the guys like the Chris Jenkins and, 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 and so on, then suddenly you're building depth and Patrick Graham can keep it fresh and rotate those guys, which we saw him do. And to me, Mo, that makes a huge difference. So I think that people will be all excited about the first and second round pick, and so will I, because that's where you need to address those big holes. But we get to the third and fourth round, I'm going to be just as interested because I want to see how they're going to build that depth and if they can get a player who can come in right away and help out in that defensive front. I'm interested to see what positions they feel they need depth at. Where is their urgency when it mm. comes to depth? I think the urgency should be at linebacker because Divine Diablo and Robert Blaine both only have one year, one year left on their deals. Right. I think there should be a little bit of urgency at safety because I'm not a big Marcus Epps guy. Is he solid? Yeah, but is I mean, is he a playmaker? You know, and then of course they need a starter at the cornerback position. I don't think depth is the issue. They got Jacorian Bennett who can who they can develop. Mm-hmm. But I'm wondering, do they go linebacker safety with their depth, or do they focus more, continue to focus on the defensive line, where they where they focused on during free agency, adding or bringing back and adding multiple players? So that's going to be interesting to see where that balance comes in. If you add in the offensive side of the ball, do they add another running back? I think they should add another running back. When we talk about running backs on this show, I'm going to be excited for that position because there are three guys that I really like for the Raiders specifically. But they're they're they can address depth at multiple positions after they address their glaring needs. Yeah, I think so too. And and because they have, I mean, you look at they have uh two, three, four, five picks, fourth round, fourth through seventh, right? So yeah. that that's helpful. And again, this is where you get it. Look, a seventh round draft pick, eh, you'd say to yourself, well, that's a gamble. You just never know. They could make it, they might not even be there. But you look at some teams in recent years, we use the Chiefs in the in the Raiders' own division who had guys in the fifth and sixth round that were playing significant time over the last couple of years. So if you go in with your board and you, and you have the opportunity to address the holes and also to build depth at certain positions, that's what you do. But clearly, yeah, the two glaring holes got to be picks one and two, I would think. And then we'll see. They might be trading around and getting more compensation in this draft, or they might do what they need to do in this draft and say, you know what, we got to we got to build, figure out who's on the street, who we can come bring in as a stopgap, and then we'll address that next year. It's always about trade-offs, Mo. You can't go into every draft. Very rarely, we've seen a couple teams do it in recent seasons, but very rarely can you go into one draft and get everything you need and address it all. 
here's my strategy for late round picks because i know a lot of people think about six and seven round picks and they're like oh it's just a throwaway who cares right <laughs> my my strategy if i were a gm with late round picks is to get guys who have a lot of playing experience because usually those are the guys that mm. can surprise you and move up the depth chart really quick because they have all of that experience you look at thayer mumford when they when the raiders drafted thayer mumford Right. I said the first thing I said was well, he has like 40 plus starts at Ohio State playing multiple positions. So he check, he has some versatility and he has some experience. And lo and behold, I'm not saying. And again, I've said on this show that I don't think Dan Mumford, you know, has done enough to say that he's the bona fide starter. Right. But he looks like a pretty good at, at minimum backup swing tackle because he played on both sides of the line this previous year. Colton Miller was hurt. Uh, Jermaine Illuminar, I wouldn't say he got benched, but he, you know, they took him out of the rotation a little bit for a bit. Their Mumford was on the field. He had a lot of playing experience out of Ohio, out of Ohio State, and he had the versatility. So, if you're looking for guys who could play and contribute as sixth and seventh rounders, get yeah. the guys who played a lot of football, have some versatility, so they could fill multiple voids if you need them. They could fill them for injured players, and you could possibly get a late round gem that way. Yeah. And then, you know, we thought we talked about end a little bit and and I, I kind of passed over because we're not getting into current roster guys. But Malcolm Coons had a breakout season last year, eight sacks. Right. And then you look at what happens um, this coming season. He's on the last year of his deal, Mo. So is another player, too. So when you talk about looking at the defensive end position uh, now, they might be able to address it with another free agent or they resign him, depending what happens, because, I mean, he's only making one point two a year right now. Uh, and maybe they maybe they look at it and and he's got an opportunity to go out and build on what he did last year. So there's guys on the Raiders too that you might say to yourself, well, they have a need here, uh, like a defensive end after next year to due to contracts. But if you have a player who they can maybe tie up and sign to a better deal now, coming off a good season without much risk to the team, then perhaps you do that. But I, I think that they're going to have next year too. They're going to have a lot of a lot of things to deal with. And so I think that's why I look at this draft and those later round picks too, and and knowing just how important it is for them to, they're not going to be perfect. Not everybody's going to work out, but to be pretty good. And Tom Telesco in his first year as GM of the Raiders, really addressing what they can and, and filling some of those holes. So, because you don't know what's going to happen. You got pending free agents for next year, and that's going to be a big part of where this team's able to build if they want to be a championship caliber roster. I also think they're going to, as a lot of teams do, I think they're going to bundle some of those late round picks to move up for certain targets. You saw it a lot last yeah. year, the previous regime, where they moved up for, I believe, Chris Smith. They moved up for Aiden O'Connell. They moved up for Michael Mayer. You know, you start the draft with X amount of picks, but you you usually don't keep like four six to seventh round picks. You, you bundle the two sixes to move up for a fifth. You bundle up yeah. two sixes and a seventh to move up maybe early Oh, fifth round pick for a guy you really like and so you're gonna probably see that as well and i think that uh with the raiders it's gonna be interesting to see how again how they spread their picks to address their depth because i fully expect them to address the offensive line with multiple players i fully expect them to draft a cornerback i you know i expect them to draft a quarterback as well yep. uh maybe a running back we'll see but it, it's to me it's you know what they say you win games with your starters but you know, duration of the seasons, 18 weeks, 17 games, you got to, your backups have to be ready to play and be ready to contribute in December and January as well. No doubt. And I do think, I know we're going to talk about running backs later on, but I even think there's going to be undrafted free agent running backs that are worth a right. look too. Right. So we'll get into that when we talk about running backs. Mo, it is Tuesday right now. Tell everybody what you got going the rest of the week so they can uh, make sure that they support you. I want to thank everyone who joined me for Bleach Report Live on Monday, talking about trades that the Raiders can execute to move up in the draft for certain prospects. Now we're going to move on to uh, sleepers next week on Bleach Report Live. Next Monday, I also have a Sports Not Feast coming out on my top targets at 13, because as Scott noted at the beginning of the show, a lot of people are confused about what I think the Raiders should do with their 13th pick. I'll make it very crystal, crystal, crystal clear on sport, sports not about who I think the Raiders should pick at 13, and I'll basically rank them to say, okay, if this player is not available, then we'll move to this player. If this player is not available, we'll move to the next player. I have about five targets up there for at 13 for the Raiders. Just five? Just I five. Mean, My top five. Okay. So uh, you're going to hate on Penix again? I'm joking. 
people follow me <laughs> on X, they'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, but hey, you know what? I'm just going to say it right now because I've been I've been oscillating, and I agree with the offensive line focus. Like, if you can get a, a, an offensive line a lineman that is a difference maker immediately on that right side, a tackle uh, at 13, awesome. But I'm telling you, if Michael Penix Jr. is there, you got to take him at 13, and I think they will. That's my opinion. I know I'm, I'm tipping my hand already, but here's what I want to know is what you think. So on our Thursday shows, of course, we have our mailbag. Got a couple calls already this week, but we want you to call in and tell us what you think about our preview of these different positions. What do you want to see the Raiders do in the draft? Do you like Michael Penix Jr.? Do you like going offensive line first? Uh, and then what about the later rounds we talked about today, obviously? 702-900-7869. That's 702 702- 900 7869. Remember your name, where you're from, and then your message. Try not to make it three minutes. You know, keep a minute and a half or so. And and if you're you know, a lot of professional sports show callers will tell you if you write down some notes really quick, you'll get through it really and you'll you'll sound awesome. But we also don't care if you ramble a little bit too. It's all about you guys. So 702 900 7869 to get into the show next week with a voicemail. We'll play on the air. And if you're shy and you want to send us an email, you can send it to mail at silverandblacktoday.com. That's mail at silverandblacktoday.com. So there you have it. We are in the books, if you will, for our Tuesday show. We will see you guys back here on Thursday uh, as we will go through defensive backs. So cornerback safety is huge for the Raiders, as well as do your phone calls on the Raider Nation mailbag. Mo, have a great uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I will see you again on Thursday. See you Thursday. All right. For Mo Moten and for our producer, Mike Robier, I'm Scott Colbranson. This has been Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey original sports podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. Until next time, take care, everybody.